Alhamdulillah, we have the tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather again and to share some reflections on Surah Al-Najm. In our first session, we covered the first four ayat, the first four verses of Surah Al-Najm, which essentially spoke about the revelation of the Qur'an, the descent of the Qur'an to the heart of the Holy Prophet. And we mentioned how many of the Mufassireen, they see the swearing on the star, hawa, as a reference to the descent of the Qur'an from the higher planes of existence to the heart of the Holy Prophet. And we spoke about how the only thing that has the capacity to receive the Qur'an, to carry the weight of the Qur'an, is the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So when Najmi idha hawa is essentially a reference to the descent of the Qur'an from the higher realms of existence, like al al-mahfuz, to the heart of the Prophet. And then we spoke about how the Qur'an was revealed in its totality to the heart of the Prophet in the month of Ramadan on the nights of Qadr. And the role of Jibra'il salam, the archangel Gabriel, is to dictate to the Prophet, to signal to the Prophet what verses to share. So the role of Jibra'il is essentially aiding the Prophet in the gradual revelation of the Qur'an to the people. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He tells the Prophet to not be hasty. Do not be hasty in reciting what has been revealed to you. So this is an indication that the Qur'an in its totality was in the heart of the Prophet and Jibra'il alayhi salam was basically signaling to the Prophet when to reveal each specific verse. So the first verses of the Qur'an spoke about the descent of wahi upon the heart of the Holy Prophet. Now, the Holy Prophet when you look at his biography, when you study his life, especially if you look at the first 40 years of his life, Rasulullah was ummi, huwa alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyina rasoolan minhum. The Prophet was unlettered, meaning that he was never taught by any human being. He never attended any educational institution. So naturally, when you look at the background of the Prophet, and suddenly at the age of 40, he shares these reservoirs of wisdom, the natural question that arises is who taught him? Where did this knowledge come from? Where did this hikmah come from, this wisdom? Where did it come from? In ayah number five, Allah answers. Now, moving forward, you know, we're going to cover inshallah verses five to 12 today. But there are two main interpretations with respect to verses five through 12. I'm going to share with you the dominant interpretation. And when I say dominant interpretation, I mean the majority of Sunni and Shia scholars. When they look at the verses, verse number five, and the subsequent verses, they say that the subject of these verses is Jibra'il. That the verses that we're going to be looking at are essentially, they revolve around the Prophet seeing Jibra'il in his true form. Because you know, brothers and sisters, Malaika, because they are subtle bodies, Allah al Majlisi, he says they have ajsam latifa, they have, you know, these light bodies. Other philosophers say that they have non physical bodies, they are mujarradat. So when they come into this life, they have to take a form. And that form that they appear in, it might be the form of a human being, that's not their true form. 
So these verses, as we will see, speak about the Prophet seeing Jibra'il in his actual form, not his dunyawi form, not coming in the form of a, a human being or another type of uh, you know, form that, the whole, that Jibra'il takes. So the dominant opinion is that this is Jibra'il. So they say that ayah number five, who taught the Prophet, where did this wisdom come? Where did this knowledge come from? What is the source of it? Allamahu Shadidul Quwa. He was taught by the one of tremendous power. So, as I said, most of the commentators, Shia and Sunni, they say that Shadidul Quwa is Jibra'il, that Jibra'il taught the Prophet because he is the He's, he's the Amin, you know, he's the trustee of revelation. And they say when you look at the Quran, when you look at other ayat of the Quran, there is a similar description given to Jibra'il in Surah At Taqweer. Surah At Taqweer is ayah number 81, Surah number 81, ayah number 20, where Allah describes Jibra'il as being. The Uwatin and the Arshi Makin that Jibra'il is possessed of strength before the possessor of the throne, meaning Allah, and of high status, of high rank. So, Jibra'il in Surah 81, verse 20, he's described as the Uwatin, possessor of power, possessor of strength. So most commentators, they say that Allamahu Shadidul Quwa is Jibra'il. Jibra'il taught the Prophet because his function is that he is the bearer of revelation. He's the Amin. Now, what do we mean when we say, when the Quran says that Jibra'il is possessed of tremendous strength and power? Jibra'il's strength can be, can mean his ability to withstand all forces from the earth. So for example, when you look at the Quran, when you look at the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to destroy the people of Lut, the community of Lut, alayhi salam, it was Jibra'il who single-handedly wiped out that entire nation. So there are examples in history where when Allah wants to destroy an entire nation, when he wants to obliterate a civilization because of its iniquities, he gives this responsibility to Jibra'il. Jibra'il is one angel, but has the ability and the power to wipe them all out. And commentators, they say, Jibra'il is also the possessor of tremendous strength because of his steadfastness and his complete obedience to God from the inception of his creation. He is one of the nearest of angels to God. Some say that he is the closest of the malaika to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is very swift, as we will come to see in the, the next verse. He's swift because when Allah gives him the commandment to descend and give revelation, there is no delay. He swiftly discharges his duties. He trans traverses all of the heavens and reaches alam dunya in a very quick, in a very swift way and delivers the revelation accurately to the messengers and the prophets. So Allamahu Shadidul Quwa. So I'm going to share with you the, the popular opinion. And then I'm going to share with you the interpretation of Ayatollah Nasr Makarim al Shirazi, where he believes that these verses are not talking about Jibra'il. And he gives his arguments for why he believes that his interpretation is more valid. 
But in, in any case, I'll give you the dominant view first, and then we'll go back and look at these ayat from the lens of Ayatollah Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi, where he says that this, these verses are not talking about Jibra'i. So the dominant view, as I said, Allamahu Shadeed al quwa is a reference to Jibra'il, that this knowledge that the Holy Prophet possesses, this knowledge comes from Jibra'il because Jibra'il taught the Prophet. And Jibra'il is the possessor of great power. Ayah number six, Dhu Mirratin Fastawa, possessed of vigor, he stood upright. He, meaning Jibra'il, stood upright. Now, the word Dhu Mirra, now in Arabic, Dhu or the means the possessor. Dhu Mirra, the possessor of Mirra. Now, the Arab linguists, they say that the word Mirra comes from the word Murur, to pass, to move. So Jibra'il here is described, according to some, as the one who possesses speed and swiftness, as I mentioned. That when the commandment is given to Jibra'il to reveal, to disclose divine revelation, he does it quickly. There is no lag time. There is no delay. And this, brothers and sisters, is also a lesson for us. That if Jibra'il is one of the muqarrabun, he's one of the close angels, one of the elite angels, because of this quality of being swift and just discharging his responsibilities, if we as human beings want to be close to Allah, we also have to have this quality that when Allah commands us to do something, we are among the ones who swiftly discharge our responsibility. We have to hasten to fulfill our responsibilities. As Allah says in the Quran, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ Hasten towards the forgiveness of your Lord. Some say that forgiveness here means the institution of prayer. When the time of salah arrives, when the time of prayer sets in, pray and fulfill that obligation swiftly and in a timely manner. Now others have said that the word mirra means power and strength. So this is basically re-emphasizing what was mentioned in the previous verses. Dhu mirratin fastawa. He stood upright. Now, he stood upright has been understood by some of the commentators to mean that he presented himself to the Holy Prophet in his true form. He stood upright so he could be visible to the Prophet in his true and his actual form. So this... Because the Holy Prophet, according to some narrations, had requested to see Jibra'il. He would hear Jibra'il. He would see him in human form. He would see him in other forms. But it seems that the Prophet desired to see Jibra'il in his actual form. So Jibra'il stood up upright and presented himself to the Prophet. Some ahadith that's mentioned in Sunni sources indicate that Jibra'il, the vision of the angel Gabriel was so overwhelming because Jibra'il, according to their narrations, had 600 wings, a very impressive sight. And in ayah number seven, وَهُوَ بِالْأُفُقِ الْمُبِينِ that Jibra'il appeared to the Prophet. In the highest horizon, in the highest part of the horizon, and completely eclipsed the horizon, that he dominated the entire horizon, and the Prophet saw Jibra'il in his pure and actual form on the horizon. Now, again, if you go to ayah number eight, so so this interpretation is putting Jibra'il as the subject. That he is the one who taught Rasulullah. That he is the one who possesses this mirra. He's the one who 
presented himself, stood upright on the highest part of the horizon. Thumma, then ayah number eight. Thumma dana fatadalla. The ayah then says, then he approached and came closer. According to this interpretation, Thumadana Fatadalla is a reference to Jibra'il. That Jibra'il, he first appears. So on the one level, Jibra'il is the teacher. Allamahu Shadidu al Quwa. He has this swiftness about him. He stood upright and presented himself. The Prophet could see him in his actual form. Then Jibra'il comes close to the Prophet. Again, this is, this is one interpretation. That he approached. Dana means to come close. Fatadalla, he came even closer. Fatadalla in the Arabic language means, according to Al-Raghib al-Isfahani, who, who wrote a book, Mufradat to Al-Fadh al-Quran, he takes the words of the Quran and he gives their linguistic meanings. He says, Fatadalla means al-Iqtirab, to come very close. That's why when a tree bears fruit, and its fruits are hanging low, that they're so close that you can grab, the, dra, uh, grab them, this is tadella. It's like hanging fruit. So close. It's reachable. It's accessible. So Jibra'il approaches. Then he approached and came closer. Then you may ask, how close was this encounter between the greatest angel and the greatest human being? You see, this is... The ayah is talking about an encounter, a meeting between Sayyidul Bashar and Sayyidul Malaika. So the greatest human being is encountering the greatest angel. He came close, he came very close. The natural question is how close was this encounter? فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى Till he was within two bows length or nearer. Now this may seem like a very strange expression. When you want to describe proximity, it's very unusual to say that they, claim, they came the distance of two bows length or nearer or closer. A bow's length was a standard measure among the Arabs. You know, the Arabs, you have to understand the culture of Zaman al Jahiliya. The Arabs of the pre Islamic era, they were, they, they were obsessed with war. It was as if war was their sport. They were always fighting, there was always conflict. So they had these bows. So they would use the bow as a measurement you see even you know their weaponry was used as a way to measure distance now just as a side note and inshallah i'll continue with the discussion as a side note some of the urafa some of the mystics they look at this verse and they see this verse as a mystical reference to an important reality. This قوسين, قاب قوسين أو أدنى, they say that the two bows can also mean two arcs. So if you look at the bow, you have two arcs, right? And when they come together, they form a singular circle because when two bows come together, they're like halves of a circle. When they come together, they form a complete circle, which represents, according to the mystics, the circle of creation. And they say that this circle has 
Qaws al-Su'ud, the arc of ascent. So you have one arc going up, and then you have Qaws al-Nuzul, another arc coming down. And they say one bow represents the arc of descent, whereby God, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings forth creation. He brings things into existence. Qawsu, Qawsu nuzul right? This is enshrined in the ayah, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajirun. Inna lillah, everything flows from God, creation springs from Him, and then the ark of ascent, so you have the ark of descent, where creation comes forth, and then you have the ark of ascent, which is, which signifies the return of creation to Allah. So everything comes from Him, and everything returns to Him. So this is represented in this circle of creation. This is a side note that's mentioned by the, the Urafa. In ayah number 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Then he revealed to his servant what he revealed. Now some of the Mufassireen, they have understood this verse to mean that Allah revealed to Jibra'il. So according to some, Sheikh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, we want you to throw more light on al adra. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to come back to it, inshallah, when I give the uh, the other interpretation. Inshallah. Now, some have understood this ayah, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Some of the commentators have said that he revealed to his servant, meaning Jibra'il. So Allah reveals to Jibra'il, Jibra'il reveals to the Prophet that it's it's with this tasalsul. However, others they say that no, this is in reference to a direct type of wahi to the heart of the Prophet when he was in Mi'raj. That this was a special revelation between Allah and the Prophet with no intermediary. Because this is a reference to that encounter between Allah and the Holy Prophet, which, which represents the closest encounter between the Creator and the created. Now the question here is, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Allah doesn't mention specifically what was revealed. فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Then he revealed to his servant what he revealed. It's like me saying, I had a conversation with someone and I said to him what I said. But I didn't reveal to you what I actually said. The Mufassireen, the commentators, they say, what is revealed is not mentioned by name out of reverence for its exalted status in the arabic language we have this concept of hadf that sometimes you omit something because of how sacred it is because of how exalted it is for example in surat al-qadr Indeed, we revealed it on the night of Qad. What is it? Allah didn't say, Inna anzalna al fi Allah doesn't mention the Quran. He says, Indeed, we revealed it. The Quran is not mentioned to highlight the exalted status of the Qur'an. So sometimes something is omitted, it's not mentioned in order, us, in order for us to appreciate its sacredness and its exalted nature. In ayah number 11, and as I said, I'm gonna go back to the verses and look at them 
from a different perspective that's actually more in line with the riwayat of Ahlul Bayt Ayah number 11 Ma kathab al-fu'adu ma ra'a The heart did not lie about what it saw So the majority opinion say that this is a reference to the vision of Jibra'il that Rasulullah saw Jibra'il in his actual form in his true form and the verse is saying that his heart did not lie about what he saw meaning that the prophet what he saw was reality it was not illusion it was not a hallucination now others have said and i'll mention this inshallah when i look at the other interpretation others have said that this is a reference to the ayat that the Holy Prophet witnessed during the Isra and during the Mi'raj. You know, if you look at Surah Al Isra, who is the Asra by Abdihi Laylan min al Masjid al Harami ila al Masjid al Aqsa, Aladi Barakna Hawl Liuriahu min Ayatina. That he saw these ayat, he saw this tajalli, this manifestation of God's greatness and His majesty. And he saw things, the ayat. Therefore, what the Prophet saw was a reality. It was not an illusion. Afatumarunahu ala ma yara in ayah number 12. Do you then dispute with him as to what he sees? Now, this interpretation that I just shared with you, where Jibra'il is the focal point. Where Allamahu Shadidul Quwa is Jibra'il. Dhu Mirratin Fastawa is Jibra'il. Where Wahua Bil Ufuq al A'la, where Jibra'il was on the highest part of the horizon. Thummadana Fatadalla, it's all about the encounter between Jibra'il and the Holy Prophet. If you look at the Mufassireen, if you look at Shaykh al Tabrasi in Majma'ul Bayan, he seems to favor the opinion that Allamahu Shadid al Quwa is about Jibra'il. That Jibra'il taught the Prophet. If you look at Al Allama Taba Tabai in Tafsir al Mizan, he also seems inclined to this interpretation that Allamahu Shadid al Quwa, the Mirrat al Fastawa, Wahua bil Ufuq al A'la, this is all in reference. To Jibra'il, the Prophet seeing the angel Gabriel in his true form. Even if you look at Sunni commentators, they also believe this. Zamakhshari, Fakhrrazi. So this is the dominant opinion. But my dear brothers and sisters, if you look at the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt seem to point us in another direction. And this is why. Ayatollah Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi in Tafsir al-Amthal, he disagrees with this view, with this opinion. Because he says, if you look at num ayah number five, so if we go back to ayah number five, Allamahu shadidu al quwa that if you're wondering where this wisdom and this knowledge of the Prophet came from, considering that he was unlettered, considering that he never attended any academic institution. That if you look at his background, he wasn't schooled by anyone. Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi, he says, it is not possible to say that Jibra'il taught the Prophet. Why? He says, because Rasulullah has a higher status than Jibra'il. So how can it be that Rasulullah is the student of Jibra'i? Allamahu shadid al quwa The ayah is not saying that Jibra'i is revealing to the Prophet, that he's teaching the Prophet. Allamahu shadid al quwa So he says the first problem here is Allamahu shadid al quwa doesn't 
makes sense because considering the supreme status of the prophet we have a hadith that say that the first thing that allah created was the nur of rasulullah was the light of the prophet that jibrail when he used to appear before the prophet he used to sit in front of rasulullah like a humble slave he used to humble himself before the messenger Allah commanded the Malaika to do sujood to Adam. So Sheikh Nasr Makan al-Shirazi, he says, Allamahu shadeed al is not Jibra'i, because we don't have any ayah in the Quran that supports the idea that the angel Gabriel is the teacher of the Prophet. Therefore, shadeed al the possessor of tremendous power, is a reference to God. He says, if you look, for example, if you look at, he doesn't say this, but I, I'm saying this. Even if you look at Surah Ar Rahman, Ar Rahman, Allam al Quran. The beneficent taught the Quran. So, Allamahu Shadid al Quwa, Shadid al Quwa could very easily and very reasonably be a reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Holy Prophet his knowledge came from God and as I mentioned in our last session Jibra'il is there to aid the Prophet in the gradual revelation of the Quran he said therefore he says is God now the question is how do you explain if we say is a reference to speed, then yes, we cannot apply this to God. If we're talking about physical motion, if we're talking about swiftness with the idea that there is physical movement, of course, Allah is not a body for him to move. But the Miratin, the Arabs also say that it's also a reference to power. So the Miratin could also apply to God according to Ayatollah Makarim al-Shirazi if we understand the Miratin as an adjective of power, of might. Fastawa, he stood upright. Who is he? Stood upright. Fastawa in the Arabic language has many meanings. Istawa could mean to stand upright. But istawa, this verb, has also been used to describe Allah. Where, where does it say this? If you go, for example, to Surah 7, verse 54. Allah says, Inna Rabbakum, Inna Rabbakum Indeed, your Lord is God, the one who created the heavens and the earth in six periods. Sized this authority over creation because now it has come into existence. So you see, istawa in the Quran is used also for God. If you go to Surah Al-Baqarah, another ayah, Allah says in verse number 29 of Surah Al-Baqarah, ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى إِلَى السَّمَاءِ فَسَوَّاهُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتِ Then Allah applied or turned to the heavens and made them into seven heavens. So istawa could mean establish, could mean to give your special attention to something. So you see in the Quran, istawa shouldn't only be understood as he stood upright in the physical sense. Because we have the, the phrase istawa ala al-arsh mentioned in the Quran. So istawa, according to the other opinion is that it's the manner in which God disclosed 
is light to the Holy Prophet. It's a type of tajalli to the Holy Prophet. Then in ayah number seven, wahua bil ufuq al a'la, Sheikh Nasr Makarim al Shirazi says this is not talking about Jibra'i. Wahua, this pronoun huwa is a reference to the Prophet. Wahua bil ufuq al a'la, because there was a mi'raj that took place. And the Holy Prophet witnessed God not through his eyesight, but through his insight, through the eye of the heart. When he reached Al Ufuq Al A'la. Wahua bil Ufuq Al A'la, reference to the Holy Prophet on his Mi'raj. Thumma, then we come to this ayah. Thumma dana fatadalla. Then he, meaning the Prophet, approached and came closer. The ahadith tell us that Jibra'il was accompanying the Prophet. He was with the Prophet during Isra, and he was with the Prophet during Mi'raj. So Isra is the horizontal journey from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. This is the Isra, the night journey. Mi'raj is the vertical journey. It's the ascension. Jibra'il is with the Prophet in each of the heavens, the first heaven, the second, and the Prophet, you know, he meets Anbiya who are in these different realms. Until he gets to the highest of realms and Jibra'il stops. The Prophet says to Jibra'il, come with me, aren't you going to join me? Jibra'il says, this is my limit. If I were to move even a little bit closer out of range, لحترقت, I would burn. Because I don't have the existential capacity to go beyond this limit. So the Prophet, he reaches, again, we're not talking about space. We're not talking about physical proximity where I came closer by virtue of physical motion. فَدَنَا فَتَدَلَّا فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَا This is a reference, brothers and sisters, to this maximum proximity. You know, this is why the Holy Prophet is the greatest of messengers. Because between him and Allah, the veils were lifted. Between you and between us and God, there are hujub, veils, curtains, curtains that many in many times we have set because of our sins, right? And there are certain hujub that are going to always be there because we cannot perceive, we cannot experience the infant. But with the Prophet, there is no makhluk that has had more of these veils removed than Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa That in this encounter, فَدَنَا فَتَدَلَّا فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَا This قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَا The Mufassireen Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi, others, they say this is a kinaya. Kinaya means that this is a figurative way, figurative language to illustrate maximum closeness between the creator and the created. Now, there's a hadith Qudsi. You know, Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi, he says, it doesn't make sense that these verses would be speaking about Jibra'i. Because what is, what is the virtue of Rasulullah seeing Jibra'i or getting close to Jibra'i? It doesn't make sense that it's about Jibra'i. Because Rasulullah is superior to Jibra'i. 
If anything, it should be Jibra'il who is trying to, you know, attain nearness to the Prophet. The ayah, these verses are talking about the encounter between the human being and God, meaning the Holy Prophet and his Lord. So we're talking about this liqa, liqa'ullah, in its purest form. There's a hadith Qudsi, you know, just so we can derive some practical lessons. There's a hadith Qudsi where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدٌ بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَضْتُ عَلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith Qudsi that there is nothing that the servant, that my servant can use to come close to me and become beloved to me than what I have made wajib upon him. You know, you and I, brothers and sisters, unfortunately, we think that there is a secret behind becoming beloved to Allah. How do we become Habibullah? How do we become beloved to Allah? That there is a hidden dua, there is a lost dua, there is some type of, you know, secret that the Urafa possess, and this is how we can become beloved, mahboob to Allah. But Allah says, if you want to be beloved to me, the best and the most efficient way to get close to me and to become beloved to me is to fulfill your wajibat. Don't underestimate the obligations that, that I have set. And he says, and you may attain nearness to me through nawafil. So you have wajibat, but the wajibat can only take you so far. If you want to go even further, if you want to go higher and attain closer in proximity, you have to do what is recommended, the nawafil, the superfluous prayers, the extra acts of worship. Allah says, if you do that, you will become beloved to me. I will love you. Allah says, if you do the wajib, I will love you. If you do the nawafil, I will love you even more. فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُ Now what happens when God loves his servant, his abd? كُنْتُ سَمْعَهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ Allah says, I become the ear through which he hears. So there is a type of union that takes place. Allah says, when I love my abd, I become the ear through which he hears. And I become the eyes through which he sees. I become the tongue that he uses to speak with. I become his hand, meaning everything about him becomes godly. He becomes a representation of what I want. I work through him. In da'ani ajabtu. If he calls upon me, I will answer him. Wa in sa'alani a'taytu. And if he asks me, I will give him. This is what happens when Allah loves his servant. And the way of attaining, the way to attain that love is through the wajibat and the nawafil, consistency and performance of the wajibat, and the nawafil. There's another hadith where the Holy Prophet ﷺ reports, another hadith Qudsi, where Allah says, فَإِذَا أَحَبَّنِي أَحْبَبْتُ That if my servant loves me, I love him, I reciprocate. وَأَفْتَحُ عَيْنَ قَلْبِ and I will open the eye of his heart. You know, your physical eye is open, but perhaps the eye of your heart is closed. You have an internal blindness. 
Allah says one of the outcomes of divine love is that the eye of the heart is opened. I open the eye of his heart so he can see, so he can witness my majesty, my glory, my grandeur. And I will not hide from him the knowledge of the select of my creation. Allah says, I will share the realities with you. You know, we recite munajat, we whisper to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the one who loves me, not only does he whisper to me, Allah says, I whisper into his heart. So now it goes from being a monologue to a dialogue that you whisper and there is a type of inspiration. You know, Musa. Allah begins to whisper, I whisper into his heart. So in the darkness of night and in the light of day, I will tell him secrets so that his conversations with creatures and with his companions will be cut off. That you become so in love with God that you don't want to talk to people anymore, that you do it out of obligation. That you've tasted the sweetness of munajat, you speak to God and God discloses these realities to you. There's a type of divine munajat that is taking place. That once you taste it, talking to the makhluk, to the creation, becomes out of obligation. And I will allow him to hear my words and the words of my angels. And I will disclose, I will reveal to him the secret I have hidden from my creation. Now, if we go back to the ayah, when this encounter took place there are ahadith that speak about this rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says lamma urija bi ila sama when i ascended to the heavens danawtu min rabbi i came close to my lord a spiritual closeness hatta kana bayni wa baynahu qaba qawsayni aw adna until between me and him, there were two bows length, like the ayah references. The seventh Imam, Al Imam Al Baqir, السلام, he says, Falamma usriya bin Nabi wa kana min rabbihi kaqaba qawsayni aw adna, when the Holy Prophet ascended and he came close to his Lord, the distance of two bow lengths. The veils were lifted and the Prophet was able to witness these very profound realities. And then Allah says what? Some of the narrations indicate that one of the things that was disclosed to the Prophet. One of the things that the Holy Prophet saw was the idea of Amir al Mu'minin being his successor. The narrations say that one of the ayat that was seen was that on the throne of God, it was written that Ali ibn Abi Talib is the successor of the Holy Prophet. And this is why some of the commentators of the Quran, they say this explains the last verse, num verse number 12, where the ayah says, 
Do you dispute with him over what he sees? Because when the Prophet returned, again, the Muslim community is very small. One of the things that he shares with them is this idea of Amir al Mu'mineen being designated as the successor. So naturally, when there's already talk about who's going to succeed the Prophet, there's going to be disputation. There are also other narrations that mention that Amir al Mu'mineen by virtue of being the nafs of the Holy Prophet, he also was with the Holy Prophet in some way, in some form during the Mi'raj. And there are narrations that mention that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, He has to use, and this is mentioned in some traditions, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, spoke to Musa, there was a voice that was created. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to speak to the Prophet, He has to create a voice. Now this voice needs to be a voice that is most comfortable to the prophet because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are he can use any type of voice but some narrations say that the voice that is used is a voice that is familiar to him and some have said that the voice that is employed is the voice of ali ibn abi talib to convey the divine message to the Prophet. So this is what some of the Mufassirin have said. So as I mentioned, there are some, the majority have said that these verses are in reference to Jibra'il, that Jibra'il is the subject and he is the one who taught the Prophet. He is the one who saw Jibra'il in his actual form. However, when you look at the Ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt and you, you, you look at the verses themselves, it seems more plausible that the verses are speaking about the Holy Prophet's encounter with God and Allamahu Shadidul Qawa as a reference to God, the Mirratin Fastawa could also be a reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there is no practical benefit in seeing Jibra'il and dedicating so many verses to this encounter with Jibra'il. What is more important is Liqa'ullah, meeting God, encountering God. And encountering God comes in many different levels. And the highest of those encounters was experienced by the Holy Prophet. This will conclude our session for this week. Inshallah, we'll continue with, verse, with verses 13 and the subsequent verses after that in our next session. وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد